So good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's Top Talk guest webinar session. I'm going to be joined by Andy Bigger. I know you're sat in the wings, Andy, because we've been chatting previously. How are you doing, mate? I'm fine, Jay. How are you doing, mate? Oh, there was a slight pause there. I think you just gave me that slight nervous pause. It was like, where's he gone? I'm very good, mate. I'm very good. <laughs> and uh, very, uh, very pleased to have you uh, with us tonight. So I've had a privilege of working with you and actually seeing your images. So I know there's some great things to be uh, sharing with the audience tonight. Andy, before we get going, um, before I hand you over the screen and we get into the presentation, for people who don't know uh, who you are, just give us a little bit of a background on how you actually got into be being the dog photographer. Well, I started um, pretty much, well, as a professional dog photographer about seven years ago. Um, previous to that, as a kind of child, I messed around with cameras, film cameras, etc. And always been around dogs as a child and, and always photographed them. But um, later in life, various careers and things like that, I decided to just experiment and try um, photographing my own dogs. People liked them. And um, I sort of plucked up enough courage to enter Dog Photographer of the Year that's run by the Kennel Club. And um, amazingly, I won a place, and uh, which was incredible. And that gave me a real boost there. I thought, right, I'm really going to go for this. That gave me a, you know, an awful lot of confidence. And, uh, and I just literally went for it and spent two years on the road, sort of uh, in a battered old Land Rover, mate, trekking all over uh, all to different dog events and taking lots of pictures. And um, I entered Dog Photographer of the Year again the following year and um, won two places, uh, which was uh, an incredible experience. And, and that just gave me, again, the confidence to say, Do you know what, I'm, I'm really enjoying this. It gave me the confidence to go professional. And it was that competition that really did set me on my way. And I, I wouldn't be here now if it wasn't for that. It's as simple as that. So in a nutshell, it was down to Dog Photographer of the Year. <laughs> Uh, brilliant. And I know we're going to be talking a little bit about that uh, later on as well, because there's some uh, interesting things with that going on. Andy, we've got a lot to get through, so I'm going to hand you the screen, mate. Thank you very much, Jay. Thank you. Um, what I thought I'd maybe start by doing is um, a lot of questions I get constantly is what equipment do you use and um, what, what's really beneficial to dog photography. And in the courses that I run, a lot of people kind of get a bit camera envy and it's all about, oh, I need the latest kit, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, in order to get good photographs. And when I first started, um, I literally had a Canon 20D. I bought it off eBay for 220 quid, I think it was. And that came with a standard kit lens that was the 18 to 55 mil. And um, that was the time when literally that's all I could afford. You know, I Yes, I would have liked this sort of more expensive gear, but I just I just couldn't manage it financially. So I went out and I literally wore that camera out. I just went out with my own dogs, took thousands and thousands of pictures. I'd been used to using film, so digital was a kind of new thing, and the whole production side and um, of it was 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 new. So I had to go through that whole learning curve, and. Um, it would that, but that taught me the fact that I had to push that camera and I had to um, for the action shots. I really had to time them perfectly because it was something like three and a half frames per second. I think that 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 camera did, um, and it was a great learning curve. And I think that's the best way to do it is, is to start and build up. And you know, I I had to sell images to upgrade my kit, and that was the key thing. I just couldn't go out and afford to buy it. I had to sell photos and again that really focused my photography on creating images that I knew people or hoped that people would buy to uh, to fund um, food, put it on the table but also for me to um, upgrade the equipment and buy what I would hope would give me more creativity or opportunities on a shoot. But I used that camera for a good year. Um, I then upgraded to the 70 to 200 f/4 version. Again, I dreamt of having the 2.8, but I just couldn't afford it. It was out of my price remit. And um, so again, I, I started with that, and that, that's a cracking lens. You know, it's very much overlooked. That's really, really sharp lens. And um, and I just kept going out, taking more pictures, selling them, thankfully, and then. I'm in a very, very privileged position, I know I am uh, now, where in my kind of kit bag, I've now got two of, you know, probably the best sports cameras on the market, the Canon 1DX. Um, I have the 70 to 200 on one of them and a 2470 or a 16 to 35 on the other. The reason why I have to have two uh, cameras in my kit bag is when I was doing trials and events for with the gun dogs, etc. 
there is no way that I could be changing lenses uh, during an event like that. It's it's far too dangerous for the camera. There's mud going everywhere. It could be pouring down with rain, etc. And also from a speed point of view, I need to be able to switch between the cameras very quickly from a wide angle to the more zoom of the 70 to 200. Uh, and, and I know how lucky I am to have those. Believe me. Um, but the lens in my kit bag that I could not do without, and literally, uh, you know, I could do pretty much everything with, is the 70 to 200. That's the 2.8 version. Um, whether you're Canon, Nikon, Pentax, Olympus, it doesn't matter, whatever, okay, but that is a great, great lens um, and it just allows me to be so creative and it's a fast lens as well, so it allows me to really capture those action shots. The other lenses that I'll use for perhaps portraits or closure shots is the 24-70 and sometimes the 16-35, but you've got to be careful with that because that can be too wide and it can make the dog's heads look a little bit strange and a little bit cartoony, which, uh, which can work and it can be a bit of a gimmicky thing, but you know, just be careful of that. Um, also in my kit bag, I've got a couple of flash guns. Uh, I've recently um, sort of joined up with Ellen Chrome as well, so I've been using their ELB 400s, kind of experimented with them, which are great. Um, I, I'm a big fan of natural light though, and I do favor natural light, but sometimes, again, to get different creativity effects and things like that, um, I will bring light in, and sometimes you might have to if it's a really dull day. But again, I'll talk about that with the portraits, because I actually love flat days where it's really quite gray and overcast, because for me, that allows me to get the detail in the portraits that, that I want. Um, the other thing I could not do without is squeaker toys. Okay, uh, These could be little uh, dog squeaker things that are in dog toys. Uh, you can buy them on eBay, I think £2.50 for about thousands, literally, but they're coming from China. They're so cheap. But they allow me just to get the dog's attention. Um, and uh, you know, it really does help to get maybe that cocked head look or just looking at the lens, etc. just why you want to take that photo. Um, it's not just camera equipment, though, that's important. When you're outside, because of the nature of the beast, um, here we have lots of rain in the UK, and um, you know it could be that you're lying down on the floor uh, in a kind of, on, on wet ground, etc. So you want to make sure that you're really comfortable. And the key thing is good quality waterproof clothing, wellies, boots, all that kind of stuff. If you're cold, if you're shivering, then that's going to affect the potential quality of the images and you're going to get bored quicker, you're going to just want to basically go home, cut the shoot uh, or end it uh, and that's not good for anyone. So make sure that you're wrapped up warm. Honestly, I've learned again the hard way and have freezing cold days, absolutely soaking wet and uh, it just isn't worth it. So, you know, classic question, what's in my kit bag? That's, that's how it stands today, the, the, but the big thing I couldn't do with that is a 70 to 200. Yes, I've got a very, very fast camera, but you don't always need that. A lot of that is down to timing, which we'll go through later. So what I thought we'd do is I'd, I'd go back to the very, very start of my kind of amateur, serious amateur professional career, and this photograph is very, very important to me and probably one of those precious photos that I've taken and it's become a kind of trademark um, photo for me. Um, and when I first started, all I did was black and white, and the reason for that is I love black and white photography, um, and um, it, I, I just love the kind of textures that, that, that you get from it. And it also made me stand out, it also created me as a niche photographer, and um, I had to bring in colour from a commercial point of view as well later, but I literally, that's all I did. And this picture was taken on a Canon 20D, okay, again, with a standard kit lens that I bought for less than 220 quid for the lot. Uh, I think it's an 8 million megapixel camera or something. And this was on a, on a shoot day, um, what I mean, I mean a gun sh um, pheasant shoot. And this dog had been brought along by one of the, the gun dog owners. And I just saw this magic moment. I actually flung myself on the floor. Um, we're going to talk about this, that, that most of my life is spent lying down, okay, because I want my lens to be directly at eye level, which is really, really important. Um, the eyes, obviously, are key in any kind of portraiture. You want to make sure that they're sharp. Um, but this picture, um, to, to me, just captures the character of a Labrador puppy. Um, and this was picked up, when I first started, I used to use Flickr a lot, and, and I used to uh, use it for feedback, really, post pictures and try and get feedback on them and see what was good and what was bad about them, potentially. 
and this was picked up by uh, an advertising agency in LA and uh, they sent me an email and I thought at the time it was a spoof you know this this can't be real but they basically asked if um, a charity called NKLA which is No Kill Los Angeles could use it and they wanted to buy the rights for it and I said okay yeah buy me this is like, amazing and uh, it ended up going uh, across it was on billboards all across LA and again this was from an 8 million megapixel camera and uh, it was just incredible and, and I think you know the reason why people picked up on this is because it's just absolutely um, you know shows that character and that's the key thing with a portrait with a dog as a person you have to show that character um, and again for me the focus on the eyes with the spotlights in there is absolutely perfect and this is all natural there's no flash at all at this stage okay and I, again I love the kind of black and white effect on there which which really works so that's a really really important one for me and taking on the most probably the basic kit that you could imagine this is a, was taken on the same shoot as well, and this was uh, one of the images that won me a place in Dog Photographer of the Year. And the key thing when you're looking at entering a competition is um, the Dog Photographer of the Year, for example, has eight categories, all with different titles. So this one was Man's Best Friend. And what I wanted to try and do with this is capture the relationship between um, the owner and the dog. And... Um, but you can see obviously that the owner isn't actually in it, but their hand is. And you can see that it's just leaning down, the dog's head is resting on it, and the eyes are just looking up directly. So your your head, your eyes are imagining that the person's there, okay? Uh, you can see the person's reflection in the dog's eyes, and it just looks, you know, it just, this dog is just showing utter love. And this picture is telling a story, and that's, and again, that's so important in, in an image to actually show a story. Um, I'm using aperture priority for, the, for, for these images as well, by the way, just, just, just from a technical point of view. Um, what I find is that when I'm out and about um, taking pictures of lots of various different dogs, in manual it's very, very difficult if you've got a black dog to a white dog to shade to bright sunlight to keep altering the settings. Aperture priority gives you a little bit of, of a head start. It's not cheating, it's just giving you that little bit of a prompter that you can control the depth of field for from a creativity point of view, from bokeh point of view, or use your aperture to control your shutter speed. Okay, but I, I, this is one of my favourite images, and, and I, I just absolutely love it. And uh, when the owner saw this, they uh, they got quite emotional, which again is what it's all about. Okay, this um, when I I started doing a lot of kind of work in dog dog photography, and um, so it would. It, what I love catching is the relationship, the bond between these working dogs, and it's very, very special. This, um, you know, these dogs have been trained to a very, very high level, and all they want to do is please their master. Okay, they want to bring back potentially the game that they've been trained to do when it's been shot. Uh, that's and they present it as a gift. And this was a shot where um, it was on a training day and um, it was in, the, again, the kind of black and white phase that I was doing it when I first started. And again, what I wanted to try and do is capture a story of this pup, and this is the, the pup's first kind of retrieving on actual game. And what I love about this is if you actually look closely into it, um, that it's telling a story. And again, the eyes, the eyes say it all, looking straight up towards the actual um, owner, the handler. You can see that the handler's hand is coming down. And there's actually a small feather on the um, finger, you can just see around here, um, which um, again, it just, it just tells this whole story uh, of exactly what's going on. Um, the black and white effect to me just gives it another dimension as well. Black and white doesn't work for everything, okay? So, uh, you know, you've got to be careful with that and use it sparingly. But again, the focus is on the eyes and it's just telling this magical relationship uh, these, or showing the bond between them, which is so, so important. What I tell my students when I'm doing the kind of face-to-face uh, -face training is that you have to imagine and visualize the shot before you've taken it. And this is where knowing and understanding your gear, your equipment is absolutely critical. And this shot was taken, I'd spent a weekend, it was up in uh, sunny Preston, and uh, which it wasn't at the time, it had been hailing for literally two days. I'd hired a lens, this was right at the start of my career, I'd hired the, I think it's a 100 to 400 lens, and on the first day, I'd literally got no shots at all, so I was really panicking here, thinking, oh my God, you know, I've, I've got to try and cover my costs, etc. Uh, 
and I was just desperate. And then the sun kind of cleared, and it became bright. Sorry, the the the, the hail went, and the, the the light got better. And I was walking in um, the line. This is how it works on a gun dog trial. So I've got the line of dogs, and they each take it in turns to do a retrieve. And I was privileged enough to be uh, allowed into this line to actually get these photographs. I just had this idea of, okay, well, let's try with depth of field. So I got my focus point, again, in aperture priority, and pointed it directly at the dog at the middle. And I think it was, I think F4 was the kind of lowest that this lens would go to. And I took the shot. And I looked at it on the back of the camera. I thought, God, that's really working. I really, really like that. It, it just shows another dimension. And um, I tried refocusing on the, the front dog and the end dog, which just didn't seem to have that compositional um, strength. So, um, so I took a few shots of this dog in the middle like that. And what I love about this shot is, uh, and this has been used a heck of a lot in, in sporting magazines and things like that all over the world, um, the focus on this dog is just absolutely incredible. He is there to do a job. You can see that he's not bothered about me. He doesn't even know that I exist. All he's looking at is what's going on in front of him and potentially waiting for his owner to go to send him for that retrieve. And that's what I love doing with working dogs is really capturing those those sort of moments. So it's, it's down to detail. It's down to looking. Always have your camera ready uh, on standby to make sure that you can get those shots when they happen because I dread to think how many shots that I've missed that, you know, along the way and, and I'm even trying but if you are slow, if your camera's not set up correctly, you're just going to keep messing, um, keep missing them which is not a good thing. Also what I did when I started out was experiment with different things and, and this is my dog Jet, this is my Labrador and this was taken in my front room and I get a lot of inspiration from from different art forms and this is where I've been looking at a lot of different abstract paintings and um, what I wanted to do was try and uh, create an image where less is more. And um, so I've taken this profile shot of Jet, and this is what was in my front room, just a simple flash. And what I did in um, Lightroom, I kind of played around with it and just tried different crops. And when I posted this on Facebook, and I kind of used Facebook at the time as a kind of test, test bench in a way, and how many likes I got depicted in theory how how commercial that image might be and I posted it and I was a little bit unsure about it but it went absolutely crazy and every shoot after that I got people coming up to me and say, oh I want that profile shot that you did it was really really good and I think looking at this in some ways this shot shouldn't work at all but it does and what what I'm kind of creating here is again the focus is exactly on the eye uh, on this one I haven't removed what we call the eye bogey so I apologize for that this is <laughs> this was the wrong version but uh, but what what I love about this is that even though we've kind of squashed the head down, you can still see that even though we've lost a bit of the ear here, we've still got the curve of the ear. So again, the client's eyes or the, the, the person looking at this image knows that that's an ear. We've also sort of cut off the end of the nose there, which again in theory shouldn't work, but it does because we've got these little whiskers there, which again is telling our brain that the nose is there and the eyes are in focus and we can see the sharp detail there. And um, I've sold a lot of these as a kind of print where um, people bought two and I flipped one so they were actually looking in at one another and we did sort of big canvases for the wall which worked really, really well. So it's trying to think of different things all the time. Uh, it can get boring just taking the same thing. So you're just trying to kind of create your own style really and kind of move through different genres which, which is a good thing to do. And uh, you know, just, just experiment. Not all things are going to work. Some of the things that I've done, believe you me, I think, what? Uh, sort of looking back at. But you know, it's good to try these things. Okay, so moving on to um, more of my colour work now, so I've kind of advanced through to colour. And I just wanted to talk about this shot because this has been, uh, this again is like a trademark shot of mine. And I've licensed this to a couple of companies who have produced coasters and trays and all that kind of thing. And it, this has sold tens of thousands of images. And um, this was one of those very opportune moments. And again, with dogs, you have to grab these. You know, dogs aren't people. You can't say to a dog, right, if you just do this, just move your arm up there or your paw or whatever. You have to work with the dog and, and you know, real, really, they're leading the session, so you have to try and work with them. Um, but this, this puppy, uh, it was their first outing out on the moors. I've been doing a training session with, uh, with, with the older dogs that this, this chap has. And he said, look, I'd love some shots of the pup. Um, so we got them out. And this is a typical game pad that would be used for holding game that's been shot, etc. And the puppies just started playing around with this. So we got this idea of 
um, putting the puppy in the bag. And naturally, they just went in it. You know, they were interested. They, they thought it was fun. Another key aspect that you should always uh, keep within your dog shoots is fun, okay? Um, and um, I just quickly ran over, again, flat on the floor, so I'm absolutely level with this dog. I think this was taken with the F4 7200. And this looks like it's been kind of um, photoshopped quite a bit, but it hasn't. The, the moors are absolutely amazing in colours and very, very vibrant. And, um, you know, the key thing with this is, again, it's telling a story. So we've got the lab puppy in the bag, but also what we've got is we've got this little pheasant tail here. And if you imagine that that wasn't there, that image would not be anywhere near as strong as that. It just looks like it's puppy in a bag. But suddenly, because you've got a pheasant tail in there, it's telling us a whole story. It's a gun dog. It's out in the shoot, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and that's why this image has been so popular because people can look at it. It's got a cute puppy in it, um, but it's telling a story and it's relating to those people. So again, when you're um, taking these photographs, don't just sit the dog down in a grass field and just blast away. Just try and think about being a little bit more creative than that. So I'm going to move on to um, portraits and. Um, I'm very, very lucky to live in a, in a 17th century old farmhouse. We've got lots of lots of old um, stables and barns that we use as backdrops now. And um, this is um, a stunning Labrador that's been photographed, uh, that, that, that we photographed in the barn doors here. And again, I'm now looking at, I've kind of moved, moved through different kind of phasing effect, but I'm now um, trying to create for my clients what I class as, you know, a photograph that could be considered a piece of artwork on the wall. Okay, so it's not just a snapshot. So we're really trying to sort of give an extra depth and an extra detail to these shots. So again, I'm shooting in aperture priority 99% of the time using the 70 to 200. I'm a great fan of very, very fast shutter speeds. I believe that, you know, uh, if, if you can, 500 per second upwards, even for portraits, gives you that extra detail and that extra quality. Obviously, I know we want to try and keep the ISO down as low as we can, uh, so, so that depends on the, uh, the available light on the day. But my focus point every single time will be right between the eyes here, okay? That's absolutely critical, so you need to know how to move the focus points around in your camera very, very quickly because it's going to change all the time. I'm flat on the floor again. We've worn out a patch in front of these barn doors where we've literally been laying all, all the time to get these photographs. And um, I think this was around kind of F4, uh, if I remember, as regards aperture-wise. But again, shooting aperture priority, focus right between there. And what I'll do is, with, with a portrait like this, it's very important to get the owner, the handler, to work with you. So what I would ask is, if, if the dog is obedient and they will sit or they will stay, then I'll ask, ask the owner to tell them to stay and then walk behind me. Obviously with the idea then that the dog is going to look straight at me. It's very, very important when you're doing portraits to get some help. Trying to photograph your own dogs is a nightmare and we, we do it here with our own dogs and it just leads to them running over and giving you a big kiss and everything because they're all excited. But what you need to do is you need to be the invisible third party. So the dog is just concentrating on the owner and the handler and you're just there and then in time the dog will forget you're there. Okay, that's with the obedient dogs, okay, and not every dog is as obedient as some of these highly trained gun dogs. If the dog is not as obedient and won't sit, sit still, then there's the thing where you can bring the leads in. You could ask the owner to hold the lead, and then what, you, what I would do here is I would ask the owner to stand behind the, the, the barn door, so they're obviously out of view as much as we can. We'd Photoshop the lead out later, but then that's where squeaks and toys would come in and treats, and I would then squeak away. Um, and trying to get that millisecond, and sometimes it can be, with a dog that isn't that focused, out of 30, 40 shots, there might be one or two, that's it, where the dog is absolutely perfect. And again, I'm trying to create the character, and the character that the owner is thinking about, of, of, of their dog, how they see their dog, and that's the important thing, always put yourself in the owner's shoes, do your research, find out the type of photographs that they're looking for. So getting some help from the owners, getting them on side and keeping them relaxed as well is absolutely critical. If the owner's stressed, the dog's going to pick up on that straight away and the dog will be stressed. And time and time and time again, I see photos on Facebook, on websites or whatever of photographs of stressed dogs. My clients would not want pictures of stressed dogs on their walls. They just wouldn't get it at all. 
what they want is their dog relaxed and chilled out, and that's the way that you get good portrait photographs. Are we doing okay, Jay? Are we all right? Uh, you're doing great, mate. Uh, a lot of, we are, we are, we have got questions, but uh, you're answering quite a lot as you go. So I think the best thing for us is to to rock, rock through the presentation, and then I'll uh, the questions that we ha that you haven't answered, I'll make sure we do in the question section. I was just checking you're still there. <laughs> okay. I'm still here, mate. It's all. <laughs> all right, cool. Okay, right. So still in portrait mode. Okay, and this is where. Uh, I mean, again, we're very, very lucky now that 99% um, of our clients actually come to us at the old hall. Uh, we're very, very lucky. But this was actually taken out uh, on a shoot. I travelled uh, quite a way for this, actually, um, to photograph this dog. And again, the brief from the owner was really, I want the character. I want to capture the character of my dog. So again, aperture priority, uh, probably around f4, f5.6. That's quite a favoured aperture for me focus point absolutely straight between the eyes and what we did here I've got the owner to stand behind me and hold a treat up and I made some funny noises and this was the shot of the session I knew as soon as we got it, this was the one it's that cocked head puppy inquisitive look and the owner when they saw this just absolutely loved it and they ended up buying this they bought a huge fray with this and um you know even to this day they're, they're, they're sending me emails now saying how, how much they love this shot because it just captures something. Dogs, humans aren't around forever. Uh, we know that. And at the time, um, at, or at some time in the future, this is going to be a very, very important image. And it's a treasured memory. And again, that's what I'm creating. That's what you would be creating, taking dog photographs. It's very, very important. Um, so capturing a character from a, from a business point of view, it means that you're going to sell more as well. Don't photograph boring looking dogs because people aren't going to buy them or if they do they're not going to start recommending you because you know people are going to see them and people who know dogs and understand dogs will see that that dog is bored and you know it's not good so always try and get that character and again use uh, or get the handler on your side use toys use treats ask the handlers to what what uh, to actually bring some treats with them favorite toys etc to make sure that you're going to get the dog's attention um, Again, on this kind of art feel, again, I'm, I, what, what I'm trying to create is, is um, you know, this, this kind of look of an oil painting in a way. And I'm not massive on post-production at all. I do a lot, as much as I can in camera. Um, I, most of my production is done in Lightroom. I do use Photoshop sometimes. I'm not the best in Photoshop, <laughs> I have to admit. So, um, so I, Lightroom is probably 90% of what I do. But what I love about this is, you know, again, trying to use my, my photography is quite dark and quite moody, which kind of lends itself to a, to a kind of quote arty look. And, and, you know, this darkened background, this black Labrador, and you've got the beautiful piercing eyes. And again, the focus, absolutely critical, right on these eyes. But unless my lens was directly level with this, you have to get into what I call doggy world. You have to get down. You have to get on your knees, you have to lay, lay in that mud or whatever to get these shots. But it, look at the difference, it's huge. If I was standing above this dog, the impact would be nowhere near as good as this. It would just be a snapshot. You've got to add value to these people who are coming um, to you to have their dog photographed. And the value is that you can get inside their world and really show the character of their dog. And this is, again, a classic kind of shot that I would do. Uh, very, very detailed. It's a beautiful classical portrait. Uh, it, it, it really sells, you know, and it's just bringing out the detail and again the look of this particular dog and the breed. Always think about the breed of dog you're photographing, um, you know, to make sure that you're really going to capture that for your client. Here's a great example, completely different breed, and this was a stunning poodle, and this was taken out in uh, the middle of a field, believe it or not. This is not a studio shot, uh, and again, I'm not a massive wizard, but, wizard on Photoshop, but this was a day, I'll be quite honest with you, this, this dog wasn't playing ball, it was quite excited, I was really struggling to get some shots, but for a millisecond, this dog just stopped, sat, and I, that's it, wow, the look. I knew this dog's a beautiful looking dog, and uh, I just shot away, got the focus absolutely perfect, straight between the eyes again, fast shutter speed to really capture that detail. And all I did is it was a really sunny day, so I just um, cut, cut out the background. And um, this to me is kind of like a kind of fashion photography shot in a way. And um, the clients when they saw this went absolutely crazy, absolutely loved it because it really does show the breed uh, very, very well, the details there. And it looks like a kind of, I can say a kind of fashion high, 
high key um, shot, which is which is great, and it really really works. And it's something a bit different. This is um, a shot that uh, I took oh, quite a few years ago now, and it was on a gun dog um, training event. And that's the thing that I'd recommend to anyone, no matter what type of photography you're doing, you've got to get out there, and you've got to just you know. Um, go to different places and, and try and photograph different things and meet as many people as you can. And that's what I did in the first two years um, of my career. And, and on this day, again, I was pretty struggling for shots. You know, the snow was starting to come down. It's freezing cold. I'd driven all the way to Leeds. And, uh, you know, I was desperate to get some shots. And during a break, um, this beautiful dog just sat by its owner. And I just went over very, very cautiously, made a little bit of a squeaky noise, and got the dog walking straight directly at me. And this beautiful Cocker Spaniel. And again, got the focus absolutely perfect, again, straight on the eyes. What I love about this is you can see that I'm getting the reflection here of the landscape behind me. And this then gave me an idea for uh, later on about using eyes and, and actually doing portraits of owners in eyes, which, which is really, really great and it was really, really popular. But again, the detail really works on this. You've got the snowdrops there, the, the beautiful black tones there. And, and this has been used as uh, Christmas cards for a number of different companies. So obviously you look at it and it just smells winter and things like that. So, so again, think about detail. Think about trying to do something different. At the um, the old hall, uh, what we started doing is using some different ideas, and we're very much uh, on on a kind of country chic look. Um, and we bought some old chairs. We just thought, right, great idea. Dogs love chairs. They're always on them at home. Let's try and take some portraits of them on a kind of classical looking chair. So we went out and bought these chairs. They're absolutely shot. There's no way you'd want them in your home, but they're great for dogs. And what we did is we uh, put them in the um, one of the barns. So this is all natural light. This is not studio. This is all natural light. And what we just did is darken the background down. And uh, we just sat the dogs in there. And with this shot, the key thing is about having the dogs in the middle so everything's symmetrical. So again, use an aperture priority, focus point right in the middle. I know I'm going on and on about this, but I can't emphasize this enough. It's absolutely critical. Uh, your focus point, don't be a lazy photographer and just keep it in the middle because your image is who wants the uh, dog's stomach or chest in, in, in uh, focus. It's just not going to sell. Okay, um, so make sure your focus point's there. And what we did is just make sure the light's nice and even uh, coming in there. And we just caught this cheeky little dog. He's a little rascal. He wouldn't sit still for long. So again, we had to be very, very quick working with the owners there. And uh, we just managed to get him in the perfect position. And again, the, the client absolutely loved this shot. And uh, they ended up buying a huge, huge frame of this. And I know it's hanging in there. I think it's above their fireplace at the moment. Um, talking about different lights, this was um, this puppy was literally only a few weeks old. and. Uh, I'm greatly inspired by a guy called Tim Flack, who I know, uh, I think Jay's actually interviewed, uh, which is which is great. And, and, and I've had the pleasure of meeting Tim, and I love his books, I think he's brilliant. Uh, and I took um, inspiration from his, 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 book, his books, and I just love this kind of idea of having a black background, etc. And um, this was taken on the front lawn of a house in the middle of a busy housing estate. And I got um, one of these cheap kind of light tents from... Uh, let's say an online auction company and um, for about 15 quid that you might use to photograph products and things like that. In. So I got the black background in there and I got one single Canon flash one. That was all, okay? And this puppy wouldn't sit still. It was throwing up all over the cover. It was, it was pooing all over the cover. It was doing all these kind of things. We were constantly wiping that black background. And I took probably about 200 odd shots of here. And, um, what I was trying to do was capture the innocence of the pup because uh, his eyes were still closed at this stage. And I just absolutely love this shot. And um, I actually posted it on Facebook and uh, a friend of mine actually ended up buying this dog and they actually noticed that there was a heart on top of the head there, which was uh, which was really lovely. And this dog's doing really, really well now. But again, the detail, the focus, again, it's all around the eyes here, even though they're shut. Um, be careful as well when you're doing this. Time and time again, I see photos with the nose in focus and the eyes not in focus. That isn't good, guys. That isn't a, a kind of niche thing. Oh, look, I've got the nose in focus. You know, clients don't want that. They want their eyes in focus. Um, so that really works with this. And again, we've got this really kind of blurred out background here, which which brings your emphasis onto the head. I just absolutely love this shot. It just completely uh, has, has hit the kind of brief for me. But again, it photographed on the front lawn 
in the middle of a housing estate, not some fancy studio. You know, again, it's not just all about having the best. It's using your creativity. Uh, you know, and and trying different things. And again, some will work, some won't. But just get out there. You know, even if you fail, there's a positivity there. You've had a go. You won't do it again. Okay. Um, this is another image where um, I did use some flash, and this was taken up in um, Scotland up on some beautiful moors. And this was taken a couple of years ago, and I've got two 580x flash guns, one either side, one left, one right. So I just got a blanket of light firing at the dog on, I think it's, this was through the lens meter in, and uh, it, this really gives it a kind of 3D effect, which really, really works, and again, the focus on the dog's um, eyes, and again, the client absolutely loves it, and yeah, this is a really dull day, so I just wanted to bring in some light just to lift the dog up slightly, i would got the, um, the exposure quite low, so again, I, I was acting like God in this case, so it's kind of bringing light into a very, very dark and backdrop, and the dog was very dark at that stage, so those flashlights were really working hard, but because the light was even, you got this even coating of light across, which, which really works. Again, I see a lot of flash photography with dogs where it's just too harsh, and it just looks absolutely awful. It's got horrible shadows, the fur does goes, the detail goes all awful, um, you know, it, it, it just doesn't work at all. You've got to be very, very careful using flash on, on, on dogs that you don't overdo it. Again, I, got, I get a lot of inspiration looking back at um, dog photographs and dog artwork through the ages. And this at a point was a beautiful, beautiful dog and a very regal dog. And, you know, in, in, in olden times, you know, these, these kind of hunting dogs were only owned by very, very, very wealthy families and you know if you go to national trust buildings sometimes you'll see huge um oil paintings of these of their hunting dogs they were prized possessions so i was doing a um a photo shoot for this client and i just got this idea these beautiful dogs uh, i wanted to try and um, capture this kind of you know very fine kind of darkened effect and um, this dog again pointers uh, certain dogs don't like sitting for long all he wants to do is run out and sniff dogs and 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 find uh, sorry sniff birds rather and find them and um, so it, you can see he's kind of looking out through the uh, horizon there to see what's going on but literally he sat down about four or five times which isn't great because you don't get much time to kind of meet in the light etc but again I've got two flash guns coming in I was using a quite a wide aperture and I just darken the background down and bam, just got this shot and I just absolutely love it. Uh, I think it really, really works for the breed and it's something a little bit different. You get that lovely kind of 3D effect and again, the client really, really loved this one. It's, uh, you know, it's very, very popular indeed. Um, try something different. Just try, again, you know, you, you can do all the full body portraits and the head but again, try and be a bit funky sometimes. And this was something that I did. Uh, I did a very, very dark and gloomy kind of black and white effect. But these little kind of puppies that I'd uh, photographed and, uh, you know, I've got a, I think this is a 2470 lens. I got quite close to it and I wanted to really sort of bring out that kind of puppy head and the eyes and, uh, you know, have something a little bit different um, as regards a portrait. And uh, so I kept the head very, very central in the actual frame there. And I think it's at 2.8, if I remember, and uh, made sure the focus point was directly in between the eyes, right on the kind of forehead there. And uh, did a bit of sort of black and white effects after. And I really like this. You know, it's, it's quite, I'm quite nervous when I'm showing kind of photos like this because, you know, sometimes it can be a bit weird and wacky and the clients don't get it. But um, this kind of thing, um, you know, they absolutely loved it. And, and it's not everyone's taste, this, um, but, you know, I, I like this style. And it's certainly a style that's been sort of um, that, that people know me for. And that's key, again, as a photographer, whether you're photographing dogs, people, or whatever, try and create a style that you're going to be known for. So when people come to you, or they come to you to, for you to create a certain look, and that's great then, because you can be really, really creative as well, which, uh, which is great, and it gives you a license to do more and more, which is brilliant. JB, okay, is there any questions uh, coming uh, through? Is there any questions? Mate, you wouldn't believe the amount of questions, and that's kind of really? why I wanted you to, to crack on, because I know we've still got a couple of key areas to cover yeah, yeah. In, in your styles and your tips and tricks. Um, but 
so we guys we will answer all of your questions but i think because i do want andy to share the rest of his presentation with you there's a good chance that we might run over slightly but but i promise you the questions will be answered um so andy no i think we need to see the photographs because uh, you are answering quite a lot as we go and i'm sifting them yeah, yeah. out as you've answered them as we go so um i was just conscious i wasn't talking too much mate <laughs> no 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 <laughs> so, no it's all right. it's all good i promise so you keep going because i know we haven't got we need to talk about the action and stuff and i know that's coming and i know you've yeah, yeah, got no some stuff to look at with dogs and owners so let's make sure we get that covered um and then we'll go crazy with the questions mate we'll have a marathon no problem mate no all problem right. at all okay okay right that's great okay right um one of the things that i love doing or the photographs that i love creating very very much is capturing the bond between the owner and the dog themselves and um, it's just magical you know and these these are images that I know are going to be so special to um, the owners themselves and, and um, many many times you know I've, I've handed um, artwork over frames etc to clients with images like this and we've both been all of us have been in floods of tears it's a very very emotional time and that to me, that reward, in effect, you know, that we've done a job that they absolutely love these images, is worth more than any financial reward could ever give me. And I've, I've got a whole series of these, but this is a very, very special picture for me. And um, give you a little bit of background on this. This this dog was not well, and you know, it was, it was touch and go whether he was going to live. And this lady has, uh, she had three Labradors at the time. And she'd asked me to come down, and what she, the brief was was to capture the relationship between her and her dogs, and in particular this dog. So what I did was this dog, you know, was not overactive; he couldn't run around too much, and I just wanted to try and get this dog in his own little world, in his space, and them together, and really capture this. And if you look at this, even me looking at it now, I kind of <laughs> quite feel quite emotional, but. Um, you know, you've just got, you can see this lady through her hair here, and I think this is quite a key because the fact that her hair is slightly covering her face means that she's there, but she's not dominating the image itself. And she's got this huge smile that's under there, and you can just see how much she loves this dog. And this dog is just kind of bowing down to waiting for Litchie to kind of come over and give him a kiss, etc. And it's just magical. I love the square crop on this. And, um, you know, she was absolutely made up with this. And we, we're in regular contact now. She's, she's coming back up for, for a shoot. And, and the amazing news is that this dog is still going strong, which is great. Um, and sadly, she's, she's actually lost one of her other dogs. And um, it, it's just, it, this honestly is so important. And when, when you're doing photographs of dogs, don't forget the owner, okay? Because a lot of owners get nervous sometimes about having their, their, their image taken with dogs and say, oh, it's just about the dog, it's not about me. Why, you know, make the session fun for both the owner and the dog and just get them involved in it. Just snap away, you know, and uh, it's these magic moments that you could get. Now, again, there's no way that I could have said to that dog, you just lie there with your head slightly bowed and, uh, you know, if you could just come in and give me a bit of grin. These shots just happen naturally and you have to be ready and have the technical um, ability to move quickly with your settings, etc., to make sure that you capture them. And, uh, you know, this ended up being a huge, huge frame in this lady's house. And uh, I know this is one image that she will treasure for the rest of her life. This is a shot that was done on a gun dog event. And this is different. Uh, I wanted to show you this because this is not, you know, this guy didn't really know that I was there. And um, the event was going on around me. You know, people didn't really care if I was there or not. Um, but this was a this is a hardened sort of gamekeeper. So his dogs are there as part of his his trade. That they're, they're, they're a tool of the trade, and um, you know he he loves his dogs, but he's not one to necessarily show it. And the the guys that asked me to go along um, uh, from the actual shoot, it, 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 um, when I showed them this picture, they said, "Oh my God, I can't believe you've got that." You know, and uh, we must have that as a frame and show. Him. And what I love about this is, you know, you've got a guy who these dogs. Um, absolutely adore him and he adores his dogs too you can see that and this dog's just leaning up and gently giving him a kiss and he's there and it's one of those magic moments that we could so easily easily miss and I love the fact that it's black and white it just gives it another kind of dimension it's got a slight kind of sepia tone in there as well but I just that is magic you know that is just magic and, and you know you, 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 there's no way that you could recapture that at all it's a moment in time that's gone we've got it captured it and it's there forever, and that's just so, so important.
this is obviously more staged in that, you know, we've got this lady here, but her two dogs are alive, and uh, she came up to the old hall, and she wasn't that keen on being in, in, included in the photos. I said, I said, come on, let's, let's have some fun, and let's just get you sat in the chair, get the dogs looking towards us. So um, we got her sat in the chair, I had an, uh, um, an assistant working with me who had, had the squeakers, etc., and we just squeaked, made funny noises, um, and we got the dogs looking, You've got to keep telling the, the owners not to look down at the dogs. That's the other big thing because that's the classic thing we'll do. You'll get the dogs right, but the owner's looking down at them. So the, the owner's got to be looking straight at you. And this to me is just a magic picture. And again, she was in floods of tears when she saw this one. Uh, she had no idea that we would get a shot like this. I think it's just a beautiful family kind of portrait. Because a lot of the people, you know, if, if they're coming to, ha to you to have their dogs photographed, their dogs are very, very important in their world on a number of occasions more important than the kids and uh, that I've had and actually the kids have not been included in the photo shoot uh, for various reasons but um, you know so think about how much they love their dogs and to capture a shot of them together there's more chance surely if you get that capture that kind of magic that they're going to buy it because it's going to mean so much to them okay um, here's one, uh, here's something a bit different as well, in that you know, you've got a young guy, it's quite trendy, and he was a bit kind of, oh, well, I don't really want a picture taken, etc. And it was his mum that had commissioned this as a kind of birthday present. So I thought, right, okay, well, let's do something a bit fashion, let's do something a bit stylistic on this one. And uh, they've got this sofa and they've got this cushion there we said no dogs on the sofa so okay right and this dog was a little bit of a beggar so he's always on the sofa so, so, so I asked him right can you just sit there down there we'll get the dog on your lap we'll get this cushion there and he's just absolutely this is great okay great idea and he really bought into it and uh, really sort of gave us a, a sort of good pose and this dog's just looking there quite innocent sort of there and I really really this and again uh, both him and his mum absolutely loved this shot and it's quite a style shot but again You've always got to have a diversity in your brain and think about different things. Think about buying signals from the clients. What kind of clients are they? What kind of things do they like? Are they very fashionable? Are they more countryfied? Are they et cetera, et cetera? And try and tailor your photography around that. And a lot of this is done by kind of pre-shoot research and asking various questions and things like that to make sure that your images are going to hit the brief. Um, People, for people who are nervous about being in the shots, well, one of my most popular shots and biggest selling shots here at the Old Hall is this, where we kind of call it the welly shot. And this is a great family portrait. You know, these people are in the shop, but they're not. But what are dogs about? Dogs are all about getting out into the countryside, getting muddy on walks, etc. So I get people to come along with their outdoor gear on. They're not dressed up in fancy suits a lot of the time. They're out in the wellies, in the stuff that they would go and walk their dogs with. And so we've got mum and dad, we've got the two kids, we've got the two dogs there, and this is just magic. This is like a great hallway shot for me, and um, you know it really, really works, and it's a lovely family portrait, like I say, because some people are a bit of a, they think it's pretentious if they've got a shot of their, their, their all of them on the wall, you know, their, their faces, etc. So this is a great way of just meeting them halfway, uh, but it's a really, really popular shot. Again, thinking about something a little bit different that you're, you're adding value for to your clients. Okay, I know there's a lot of questions and uh, about action shots, and uh, this is what I'm going to go on to now. And uh, this um, shot was actually taken on uh, one of the photos that we took during the filming uh, with Jay when he came up here. And we're very lucky again here uh, on the farm. We've got access to water. And um, as you can see, we've managed to capture this spaniel uh, jumping through the water and again look, think about where I, I am in this I'm kind of very very low I'm right on the bank side I'm really I'm kneeling down so my um, camera my lens is level with the dog as he's jumping through and this is down to timing but I would shoot this on aperture priority and that might be a shocker for some of you and you say, well why don't you use manual and that kind of stuff I, I, I'm just a fan of, of aperture yes I do use manual for certain things but I'm just so used to using it and I, I'll control the shutter speed through the aperture by how much light I'm letting through into the camera obviously. Now I use a very fast shutter speed or try to as much as I possibly can. I would say a minimum kind of shutter speed is like a thousandth of a second if possible. Ideally I would try and use 1600 or 2000. Again, some of you might be thinking that's too much. That's absolutely fine. You you do what you're doing. But I know that with that kind of shutter speed that we're going to capture that detail, okay? But 
you know what I'm going to say, the focus point, every single time I try and keep it on the dog's eyes. So this may mean that I have to move it around in my um, camera uh, in, in the actual uh, focus screen. So I, again, it may not be central, I might move it off center. Because if I know that the dog is running from left to right, then the chances are that the focus, the, the dog's head is going to be around here. So that's where I would pre set my focus point, okay? So when the dog's jumping, I can track, 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 and shoot. I use back the, the back focus button as well. I do find that more accurate, and I will track the dog from running into the water and try and track him jumping through. But a fast shutter speed just gives you that edge. Aperture-wise, try not to go below f4 if you can. Um, the classic mistake that I see people doing, they go out and they buy a 2.8 lens, and suddenly everything is taken in 2.8. Big mistake. If you're using 2.8 fraction shots, your depth of focus, your focus area in effect, is very, very small. You know, so you have to guarantee that your focus point is literally on the eyes, otherwise you're going to miss that focus. It's very, very difficult. Sometimes through lighting conditions, if I'm doing where one of the championships, gun dog championships for the kennel club, and I'm in a dark and wood, then yeah, sometimes I've cranked the ISO up to as high as it can go. Uh, you know, there's, there's there's nothing else I can do. I have to use a wide aperture. Um, when I've done the Crufts events, when I'm in the main arena and I'm trying to get an action shot, I'm literally at 12,000 ISO, 2.8 aperture, and I'm still not getting the shutter speed that, that, that I want. But so then it's a matter of a blast and see. There's nothing more you can do and just hope that you get one in focus. You know, um, cameras for that kind of um, um, photography, they haven't got it yet. The 1DX isn't good enough. Okay, it isn't good enough yet. Uh, I'm hoping the Mark II will be, but you know, so you have to work within the limits of your equipment, and that goes for you know, if you're working on um, or using you know a slower frame rate camera, for example, uh, it could be four or five frames a second. What you have to do then is wait a bit longer, wait until the dog is closer to position, and then shoot. Don't just blast and see for the sake of it, because there's no point in taking thousands of pictures and just picking one out. You, the, it's, uh, all of this, no matter what frame rate camera you've got, is down to timing. Okay, and the, the better you get at timing, the the higher consistency rate you're going to have, and that's the big thing that I teach my students when I'm kind of teaching them. And I know we cover that in the film um, with the, the the we've recorded. Um, you know, so uh, just just remember those points. It's so important. Here, here's another one that I took. Uh, again, this is at the old hall, and um, this was a, a really narrow aperture, to be honest. Sorry, a, a, an open aperture. This was also about, I think it was about f3.5 or something, if I remember, because um, it was a really dull day. And there's always an element of luck with these guys as well. You know, it's it's, it's you getting the the focus point absolutely right. The dog jumping exactly where you're predicting it to jump to. You know, don't just think that every one of these is going to be in focus because crikey if I showed you mine you know they they are not even using cameras a lot like um, as the uh, 1DX but what you're doing is you're giving yourself a higher chance you know you're moving the odds up by getting your camera settings right so you know with with a bit of luck etc you may get these the, these action shots and we've just captured this dog in what I call full flight mode his back legs are coming off his front paws are plowing through that air there. We've still captured this water coming off his paws. That, to me, is absolutely perfect. When the client saw this, uh, and this, this guy's a hardened kind of gun dog guy, and he just asked, you know what, Andy, you've absolutely got it. And um, this is just a magic shot. And we, we did this about three or four times to get the shot. This was actually on the second take. So we got it quite early in, which is key. But again, you might have to do this sort of three or four times to actually make sure that you actually get one that, that is of this quality. Here is uh, one that I'd wanted for a long, long, long time, and it's taken, it took me a long time to get. And this was up in sunny Scotland. Uh, it had been raining, and suddenly the blue sky came out. And I was using, it was a 5D Mark III, I think it was, for this one. So the frame rate is fast, but it's not super fast. And again, about five frames per second. So I lay on the floor with this 2470 lens. You can see that I've got both sides of this jump in. If I'd have missed one of those, it would have looked uneven. It wouldn't have worked. So I'm literally lying on the floor. This was not a remote trigger. This was me on the floor with a crook neck, lying literally underneath that jump. This dog was an amazing dog, and sadly, he's, he's no longer with us now. Great, great shame. 
um, and he just absolutely was perfect. So I was lying there, with, this was on the first take guys that we did this, this was taken at F8, the light suddenly came out, so there's loads of natural light to use, shutter speed it was about uh, 1600, something like that, and my focus point I'd moved to the very, very top end of the camera, so what I did, I knew the dog was going to come over me, so I waited, waited, waited until the dog jumped, then bang, um, hit the shutter button, and literally kicked in, and I just felt it, I knew I'd got this shot straight away, and the dog literally landed on my head, he wasn't bothered, this dog was so well trained, just literally bounced down on me, bounced off again, wasn't bothered at all, and what I love about this, again, we've got him in full flight mode, uh, feet up, off the ground, paws completely up, job done, mission accomplished, and, but again, I give myself the best chance of having that shot, by using um, an aperture like F8, where hopefully everything was in focus, within the frame, to give me uh, a, as much a chance of getting the dog in focus, which is what it's all about. If I had just got the bar in focus and the dog not in focus, it's just not going to work, guys. Jay, are we all right for time? Are you okay? Uh, we're good. I mean, we are going to run over with questions, but we're obviously we're, we're aware of that. But um, you've only got a few more slides left anyway, Andy. Yeah, I've only got a couple on that more, mate. I promise yeah, okay, you. Go for it, mate, so okay. Sorry, okay. All right, okay. Right. So here's a fun shot, okay? And this was taken. Um, this this is quite an important one that I wanted to cover. Uh, guess what happened next? I think is on this one. Um, I'd taken the shot. I'm lying on the floor, and I'd asked the owner to throw this Kong toy towards me. So we've got these 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 dogs running towards me. And this is a great shot because look at this dog. He's absolutely fixed on getting this this toy before the other two. This guy's completely miffed at not uh, making it. You can see he's like, oh my god, and this one too. Um, but what happened next, okay, well, I'll tell you what happened next, okay, was that they went plowing into me, and I literally ended up with a bloody nose and a black eye, okay. Um, what you have to be careful of, and this is a key tip when you're photographing dogs, these dogs, Labradors, for example, are a big dog, okay, and if they're going to plow into you, it could potentially hurt you. So, you know, be aware of that, okay, and also be aware that the dog may get injured as well, and I always use a lens hood, so if, if, the, if this does happen, the dog can plan into it, the chances are that the lens will shatter, it's not going to cut through the dog at all, it'll just shatter, it's plastic, the dog will be fine, you'll, you'll be fine, your lens will be fine, and all will be well, but you might end up with some slight bruising. But this is a great fun shot, I absolutely love this one, I think it's great, and uh, it just shows the fun that these dogs are having, and that, again, I, I'm emphasising this word again, fun, photo shoots have to be fun for the dogs, otherwise you're just not going to capture those shots. Fast shutter speed on this again, I think was using about f5.6 or something like that as an aperture. This shot was one that I wanted for a long time again, um, took probably about two, 250 shots to get this, I've got a series of these shots, uh, this cock spaniel jumping, but you know, you just have to be ready, you have to work with the owners, tell them to throw the ball in the position the way you want the dog to, to run and jump, and we just did it time and time again, we got this dog really excited, and it just skipped. Now, there is a huge element of luck taking this type of shot because you can't just go to that dog, I want to jump at this particular moment because I'm going to have my focus on you and I'll press the shutter speed. Good luck with that one, okay? You've just got to literally blast it, take lots and lots of shots, but again, time and patience and skill will, will, will um, give you the advantage on this and you will get it. Otherwise, if you're just constantly just moving your camera around and just hoping that you get the focus on the dog, you're not going to get it. So learn to track the dog all the time, follow through, use, use your focus, track, 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 shoot, 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 okay? But make sure that your focus point is going to give you the best chance of getting on the head. It's so important and keeping those eyes in focus. Um, great shot, get some fun shots again with toys, balls, etc. This is a great shot, shot, I call this the land shark shot, okay? Just a bit of fun, got some nice blue sky behind, dog jumping up, okay? As, whilst we're taking really kind of arty portrait shots, clients also like to see fun shots as well. And you know, this may not go in the wall, but it's a great one that they might buy for iPad or whatever they're, they're doing it as an electronic image, just as a kind of to show the, the true character of the dog. You know, so don't let get hung up about just action, so just portraits. You know, when you're doing your action shots, try and get some fun in there too. Um, when you're doing a kind of action shot with, uh, with dogs, a key thing is water. So yeah, you're getting the jumping in shot, but don't forget when the dog's bringing that ball back, 
if you've got a really still day, the beautiful thing about using the elements in natural light, and you can see here what I've done, I've, got, I've kept this, I think it's a 2.8 aperture, uh, aperture, so again, I'm, I'm using, I'm changing my aperture and settings constantly, all the time, so I know my camera inside out, I know what the buttons are, I can literally do it blindfold, and again, by using aperture priority, I get that creativity, um, but what I've done is I've, I've caught this reflection here beautifully, plowing through the water, swimming back, you've got this water coming through his mouth, and it's a lovely, lovely shot. So it's a portrait stroke action shot, and again, very, very popular with clients, but I'm really, really low down, again, making sure my... I think we're there, Jay. Do you want me to, to go through this before questions? Or? No, I tell you what, let's leave that on the screen so they can see okay. your top tips because we've okay. got we've got a lot of questions mate so um guys we'll stay with you stay with us we're not going anywhere we'll answer your questions i promised you we would uh, they're not in any particular order and i'm just going to give you them in the order that they came through so we might be okay uh, jumping around about talking different about different things that's okay now we know uh, as, as you've explained tonight that the majority of your photography is based around natural light where you can um, obviously yeah. you've talked about the fact that you do sp use speed lights uh, if need be and obviously now you've just started using the uh, the Elinchrom ELBs as you said um, yeah so just to just to reconfirm that really where you can it's always natural light yes bud Definitely, absolutely. Try and use natural light as much as possible. And, you know, bright sunny days are just horrible. You know, it, it is tough, but try and find some kind of shade. Try and find some kind of flatter light in effect. And, you know, always be very, very conscious of shadows and things like that. But trust me, natural light, you know, where where are dogs most of the time? They're outside, okay? And they're in natural surroundings. So I find it, you know, it just represents the dog so much better to try and use natural light and or if you're using artificial light then use it sparingly don't crank them up full power and just blast light in for the sake of it it just looks awful well that leads to the next part of the question to be honest so if and where you are using speed lights or the ELBs um, are you using any kind of soft boxes have you just said you dialed down are you using any kind of soft boxes at all and yeah um, sometimes with, with speed lights uh, obviously you've not got the power there at all. So um, what I do is just put a, a simple kind of plastic diffuser over them just to try and spread the light a little bit. But again, because they haven't got that much power, you, you still need those relatively close. But you certainly have something over them. You don't want to be shooting, you know, directly um, that harsh light because you know flashes can be can be awful sometimes. So yeah, you just just get a cheap plastic diffuser. That 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 does the job. Um, so if I'm using more powerful um, lighting, then yeah, I tend to use quite chunky soft boxes. Brilliant. And um, so the last bit on this one, uh, this was quite a nice question actually. Somebody asked, um, do the, the with the artificial flashes and the actual flashes going off, does this distress the dogs at all, or are you just careful in how you use them? It's a very good question actually. Um, I, when I'm when you're photographing dogs, this is a very very key point. I'm always conscious of finding out if the dogs have any health issues, okay, because it could be, for example, if they've got arthritis or they've got a kind of injury, then they may not be able to run for the action shots and that's not a good thing. Um, sometimes, on two occasions it actually happened where I've gone to use the, the, the flashes and the client said, oh, would you rather not because um, the dog has previously, maybe they've been in a situation, it could be a fireworks or whatever, there's been flashes can obviously stress them, or there may be, uh, I don't know, like epilepsy and things like that, and you've got to be careful. So always ask the question before you use them, definitely. Brilliant. Um, this question uh, was quite apt, really, because, uh, again, it will lead us on to uh, your film series that starts with us tomorrow. But uh, obviously we've yeah. talked about protecting yourself with protective clothing, as we've said, um, and uh, we've touched briefly about what's in your kit. But somebody, because we've talked about, obviously, the, the nature of the job, you, you know, you are shooting in the elements, whether it's raining, sunning, uh, you know, snow, sleep, whatever it is. Um, so what protection do you use for your camera? And I know we cover this in the video, and again, that's going live tomorrow, so people can check that out. But are you using any then protection at all, covers and so on? Uh, when I, yeah, I mean, literally, you can, uh, when I first started, I just used to use, use like um, a plastic shopping bag, literally, you know, punch a hole through it and cover it if it's pouring down with rain. I mean, that, that does the job. I mean, there's various kind of waterproof covers, um, I, I just use, I, I don't even know who it's made by, I'll be honest now, it's just a standard kind of plastic 
cover that just covers the lens, covers the camera body. Um, whilst the manufacturer states that they are kind of shower waterproof, you know, you just don't want to take that risk. Um, so be careful. Always protect your gear. Yeah, it's a very, very good point. Well, um, this was quite interesting when we were going, sort of going back actually towards the beginning when we were looking at the gun stuff, the gun gun stuff, uh, the gun dog shoot. Sorry that you you know you were yeah. photographing. Um, with these kind of events, did you um, were you invited or did you ask if you could go along? How does people get started in shooting these sort of things? Um, when I first started, I was uh, literally, as I said, literally just out on the road going to as many events as I can. And I just literally. Uh, used to ask if I could go, or uh, you know, I knew people that were going, and um, you know, asked them to invite me or whatever. What you have to, for those of you interested in, uh, and I know this may not be everyone's cup of tea, but for those of you interested in, in photographing gun dog events specifically, what you have to be careful of is that if you're photographing a trial, for example, this is a competition, and these uh, the handlers may have trained their dogs for years to get there, and there could be huge. Um, prizes at stake, not financially, but from a credibility point of view. When you're in, uh, what you have to do is you have to earn your credit in effect. And I'm very lucky now where I, at the, the various championships that I go, I'm standing right by the judges and right by the competitors. Now, if you imagine that if the dog's coming back with a retrieve and I'm lying on the floor and I'm blasting away and I've got shots flying here, there and everywhere, and the camera's making an awful noise, it could distract the dogs and potentially it could cost points and the owner and, and the dog could be eliminated. And I've actually seen photographers actually do that and have actually been banned for life from attending these events. So you have to be very, very careful and always be aware that, you know, um, is it worth, you, you, you cannot risk a shot uh, potentially on the, at the expense of distracting the dog. So um, if you're interested in, in photographing these kind of things, um, you won't be allowed directly in the front line, so to speak, with, unless you've kind of got a proven track record. Uh, but what I will do is go to like training events and things like that, gun dog training events. Uh, that's great experience because the pressure's off there. It's just a training event. You get lots of opportunity to practice. And I, I would just get on the phone, be proactive like any business, you know, that you just have to just get your name out there. Brilliant, mate. Uh, okay. So um, when starting out with the shoot, um, how how much time do you spend yourself as the photographer building the relationship with the dog? And are there any sort of true and tested ways to sort of break the ice? Or is it different for every animal? It, it, it varies a lot. What I try and do is, um, again, kind of get a brief from the owner before about, you know, some dogs are more friendly than others. Some dogs might be more wary of, of uh, kind of new people. Um, and all I do is, you know, we're, we're, before we start to shoot here, then we'll always spend like five, ten minutes having a chat. And, you know, I always ask to, you know, say hello to the dog, perhaps give him a treat or her a treat, etc. Um, dogs have a... Uh, have a I, I, I call it a kind of opportune time in effect or a uh, window of opportunity and that that literally with every dog, if you're asking to sit and stay and that kind of thing, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, anything beyond that, that is plenty, any more than that and you're really pushing it, you know, so you've got to guarantee that you're going to get those shots within that time, uh, you know, because dogs just get bored, you know, they're not used to sitting there, all they want to do is get out and run about, so you have to use that time very consciously. So you don't want to spend all that time just fussing it and saying hello. You know, you want to get the session moving. But again, it's keeping the owners involved, making sure that the dog's comfortable, the owners are relaxed. If the owners are relaxed, the dog will be relaxed. It's just, it's just that circle. Keep, keep that circle fun. Otherwise, it'll just be a vicious circle and just go horribly wrong. Okay, so this one's uh, this will be an interesting answer. Uh, from your point of view as a successful uh, dog photographer, do action shots sell better than portrait shots? It's a very, uh, that's a very, very good question. And um, a lot of the clients, when they come to me, they say they, they've seen my action shots and, you know, oh, yeah, we, want, we love action shots, that's what we want. But when they actually see the images, the portraits, um, show off so much detail and yes you can get that in action shots yeah but um the act i'd say without shadow of a doubt or portraits are far more popular brilliant there you go um are you shooting raw or jpeg or both uh raw every time raw i like I, I like this question when it came through this came on quite early so um my wife wants a pro photo f shot of my six foot tall son with our Jack Russell 
uh, as a huge canvas. Um, what's your best advice for me putting this picture together? Okay, uh, that's an interesting one. A couple of options there, really. I mean, as a fun shot, it, it'd be great to get you know your son obviously standing up right in the Jack Russell area, all you know as a as a kind of bit of fun, and uh, that'd be great. Um, what you could do there is obviously get your son to kneel down, to lie down with the dog, etc. So it's more on a level if that's what you wanted, or even lying face down in effect and having the dog sort of by by his head. So um, interesting one that, yeah. No, but but keep it fun and just just take a variety of different shots and just see what works. I think that I think the six foot tall. It's got to, you've got to think about doing the big the big portrait, especially oh, in, port, in portrait mode as well, isn't it? I think um, it'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely brilliant, tremendous. I I enjoyed that question when it came to the thought. I had to ask you that one. Um, where <laughs> where do you where's your view um on your standing on removing the collar for the portrait? Um, it's it right? Okay, that's a lot. Of that's down to the owner. What I do is um I always ask them. Some people have very, very expensive collars, you know, uh, you can get Louis Vuitton collars and things like that, and I've, I've had some clients who have spent an awful lot of money on, on this stuff, and, you know, for me to then go and remove it is a bit of a, <laughs> bit of a no-no, uh, because to them it's part of the dog. Um, sometimes you might get someone to turn up and the collar is not particularly great and it's a bit scruffy, etc. So I always ask the question, would you like the collar on or off, you know, what would you prefer? And actually, when they stop to think about it, probably they would take the, the collar off, so it's just the dog in its natural form. Sometimes, however, if you are using a lead, then obviously you need the collar on there. Um, and, and again, I just ask the question, do you want us to remove the, the, the collar as well? And some do, some, some don't. It's personal preference. And again, you've got to ask them because it's not your decision, it's theirs. Brilliant, mate. Um, okay, uh, any advice for calming down a very excited dog? Any top tips for that? Um, very excited dog. Okay, right. What what you have to do is move very very quickly. If you've got a young dog and it's not you know not every dog we get along is well trained. Believe you me, and you know we have dogs that won't sit for love and money. So what you have to do is you have to work within the dog's capabilities. If the dog won't sit and is happy standing, you photograph it standing. If you try and force that dog to sit down, it's not going to look happy. You know you're not going to get a happy photo. So it's not going to potentially sell, and it's not going to look great. So work within the dog's limits, you know. And if the dog just, if it's not working, if it just isn't happening, then on two occasions I've actually had to say, look, you know, it's just not happening today, guys. You know, we can't control it anymore. Let's just do it another day. And the clients have come back, and it's just gelled. It's just worked. You know, dogs, dogs have good days. Dogs have bad days. You know, it's just like humans. So you have to, uh, you know, respect that. Um, so, so but tips as regards working with squeaky toys, treats, get the, get the owners to work with them, um, leads, etc. use that, um, and just move fast. You know, you can't expect that dog to be sat for half an hour. You just faff around with your settings and try different things. You know, you, you have to be on the ball and on the button and, and, and make sure that you're going to get it first time. Brilliant, mate. Um, we've actually got a question here relating back to uh, the black and white shot of the head of the poodle, but I actually have that as my question time slide. So if I rob the screen back, at yeah, least, sure. then we can, um, the guys will be able to see uh, the image again and also obviously your answer. So it should just be, I just want to make sure it's back. Yep, so everybody should be seeing it now. Okay, so the question was about this shot. I, I don't know if you you know the shot I'm on about, and if you can't see it, mate. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, um, the poo in the, with the shot of the poodle, the focus, as you've said several times about the headshot portraits that you've been doing, is right between the eyes. Um, what, um, what aperture were you using so we had that sort of out-of-focus effect around the dog, or have you added a bit of out-of-focus around the, the dog's neck and sort of base of his ears? Um, do you know what? I can't, I can't remember the exact aperture, but I know it's pretty wide aperture. What I did, I think, yeah, I did add a slight bit of a kind of blurry Photoshop out just to... I don't use Photoshop that much, but for certain images, certainly like that one, it's a real potential headliner, and, and you know I absolutely love it and get everything to come together. There may have been a slight bit there, but it was a pretty wide aperture anyway. I try and use that as much as I possibly can, um, you know. But as regards post post production on that, it was pretty much a straightforward black and white conversion, and you know I, I'm not the world's greatest at cutting things out at all. I can assure you. And, because it was quite, um, the sun was quite bright behind that. Uh, it was a really bright day. It was really tough conditions. Uh, it did cut out quite easily, thank God. So, uh, 
well, my job is quite easy. We have, uh, I know you know this, we have a six month year old uh, Cocker Spaniel, Jet Black Cocker Spaniel. And I showed, I know this is a poodle, but I showed this image to, to Mel last night uh, saying this is one of the images I was using to promote the webinar with because I love it. And uh, Mel's already said you have to do this with, with our Cocker <laughs> Spaniel, Percy. And uh, I think what we'll have to do there is we'll have to get either you to Percy or Percy to you because when people are talking about a, a hyperactive dog and how to control control one this is going to be your nemesis mate because <laughs> i love him to death you film it then Jeff. You yeah we'll have, to, it. we'll have to film it we'll have to do it it's gonna have to happen but mel wants this <laughs> shot so you've been warned mel, i want this shot as well it's beautiful but i want this of, I know. Of, of percy so i think we've got four dogs as you know so you're gonna have to spend the day with us you yeah. have to shoot them all mate i'd love to Brilliant. Love to, mate. We'll make it happen. We'll make it happen. Brilliant. Um, we had a couple of questions on the next theme, which is quite good with regards to you've talked about sort of um, your images being used. So even though um, do you have to get a commercial license or do you need to get, a, you know, a, 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 technically a model release, I guess, for, for taking the pictures of the dogs? Where, where does, how does that work, Ant? Um, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting one. Um, I do use a model release now okay i must admit when i first started um you know i i didn't but i always ask um clients you know if if if, if an image is going to be used for commercial entity or an advert or something like that i always think out of courtesy it's nice just to tell them what's happening um you know and uh, i've never have ever had an objection if anything it's quite the opposite it's normally like where where's it being used can i have a copy kind of thing and Partly, you know, a lot of that is down to the relationship that we build with our clients. You know, we end up uh, having a very close relationship with our clients and, and an ongoing relationship with them. And, um, you know, they thankfully value what we do and uh, and have been pleased with the results. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would say that a model release is probably the safest way of doing it. So if you did want to use an image and there was an issue, then, of course, you know, you have got it. But... Sadly, you know, the, the, the licensing, um, a lot of people think, oh, you know, we can make money out of stock images for dogs and things like that. It's very, very tough. You know, there's so many people out there doing it for for no cost uh, these days. It's just very, very hard. And, uh, you know, I I, 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 I certainly, it, it, it's not a market for me, put it that way. I, I've just been very lucky that these images have been spotted, spotted and, you know, we've come to an agreement. Brilliant. Um, I mean, that goes, I think, for stock, full stop, never mind whether it's yeah. dogs, animals, buildings, food, uh, the industry yeah. is completely changed. And, uh, uh, but yeah, I, I figured it'd be the same, better to have yourself covered than not covered, isn't it? Definitely. Especially if there's yeah, some brilliant... I would do. Yeah. Um, obviously, we've talked about, uh, obviously, we're, we're shooting dogs, we're shooting action. Um, I know you've sort of touched on it, but a few people have asked to elaborate on it. So you are kind of shooting, especially with the action, I suppose, more than anything, uh, shooting bursts of, of images. You, you know, you're opening the, you know, uh, the, 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 you know what I'm trying to say, don't you, Anne? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. no completely. No, no, absolutely. What what I would do is by using the, the back focus button, you're literally saving yourself because um, you know having to take lots and lots of shots just to get your autofocus um, working. Because the danger is that even with the fastest camera and the fastest memory cards, uh, and that's a key thing. And make sure you've got a fast uh, memory card in, in your camera to make sure that you're going to maximise the potential of your frame rate. Um, but if you start shooting too early, then you can hit that buffer very, very quickly and your camera just stops. And that's so bloody annoying if you've, if, if the dog's in position and bang, you start, your camera stops. Um, but yeah, just use your back focus, track, track, track. And then when the dog's, if it's an action shot, it's just about to launch and jump. As it's just about to launch, then you press the shutter and then go and shoot a burst. And obviously the reason for shooting a burst is that your autofocus will be in tracking mode. Uh, on because I use Canon, I use our servo for that, and uh, so it just makes sure that it's constantly tracking that dog, um, and uh, you know, hopefully, we're giving ourselves the best chance of having that dog in focus. It doesn't work every time. I guys, I can't stress this enough. Don't expect a series of ten pictures for everyone to be super sharp and beat yourself up about it because it's it's just impossible. Uh, brilliant. Uh, when well, you've answered actually questions about the focus as well, so there's two birds, one stone there. Brilliant. Um, are you actually what came through then further on down was um, so we talked about that in the action shot. So you're actually still shooting bursts in the port when you're doing the portraits as well. 
Yeah, what, what, what you'll find is because dogs are moving all the time and what I do is short burst because if, if you've got a dog and, you, and you're just snapping like one, two, three, the amount of time, if it's, you're literally just shooting one, one shot a second, the dog will be moving so much in that time and if you play back even like five or six frames, the chances are that that dog has had some eye movement, some head movement or whatever, or it's had its tongue out, its tongue's in. Um, so you know, whilst whilst I'm not a great advocate of just you know shoot and blast, what you'll find is with dogs it's different. You know, in order to capture their character, you have to take a ton of pictures. And the great thing is obviously now with digital that you just bin the you know the ones that you don't want straight away. So it's not cost you anything. But yeah, don't be frightened to take a lot of pictures. And you know that that's not being lazy or just hoping for the best. So long as you know what you're doing and you're trying to capture that character, then you're just giving yourself that better chance. Uh, brilliant, bud. Um, okay, so on an average uh, dog shoot, how long, to, how much time do you spend on a on a portrait slash action session? Okay, on an average shoot, I allow about an hour. Um, I, I say to a client, an hour. And if it, if I need more time from that, then that's fine. We'll we'll do it. That's my decision. If the dog's, you know, needs a bit more time to be settled. But uh, normally for portraits, you know, 20, 25, half an hour. 30 minutes tops, you know, you cannot expect a dog just to be robotic and just sit there for any more time of that. And obviously, you know, you're moving things around, we'll have little breaks in between that as well. And I'll just say, you know, just just, just, just put your dog on lead and walk around. And that, that I always do portrait shots first. That's another uh, point I meant to mention before is, you know, don't get the dogs running around and having a free-for-all and then sit them down for a portrait because the tongues will be hanging out, they'll be drooling and all that kind of stuff. Do the portraits first before they start getting too excited if possible, and then when you've done the portraits, then just go and have a blast and have some fun. Brilliant. Uh, we are getting there, and but the questions, oh, right. uh, we're getting there, it's all good with me. Um, let's have a, okay, this was quite a nice comment, so it's obviously somebody with maybe a bit of uh, knowledge or a bit of uh, experience uh, with, the, with the dog photography, and he's referring to uh, some comments that he's had from judges of photography. We've t You've talked tonight uh, about, you know, shooting between the eyes, uh, and going um, um, for for the focus between the eyes. So uh, let me read what he's written so I don't get it wrong. Yeah, sure. um, so certain judges have commented that while the eyes might be the focus, the nose is not because of the f-stop is at 4 or 5.6 when they say it should be f8. But I noticed that you don't seem to worry about this. So do you have a personal take on that? Um, the key thing with using a wider aperture is that so you have to... When I've got the focus point, you may think, and this is down to your kind of lens and camera kind of calibration really, your focus point might be between the eyes, but actually it might jump to the nose sometimes. So you have to, it's another reason for taking like bursts. So you, you might move your focus point up a little bit so it's just on the top of the head um, so that you absolutely guarantee that you get the eyes in focus. Um, I, I can't speak for other judges, obviously, because everyone's got their own personal opinion. But I, from my personal point of view, if it, if I was judging any competition and a dog uh, photograph presented, and you know the the eyes were out of focus, then uh, you know unless it was absolutely meant to be, and you can see obviously that that's what the the photographer is trying to achieve. But nine times out of ten, it's just the fact that they were lazy and have missed it. So it's not going to score in my mind now. Okay, cool. Right, let me see if I word this correctly. I'll read it as it's written because it's a bit tacky for me because, you know, I'm the least tacky photographer in the world. Um, using a narrow depth of field, high shutter speed and natural light, how much would you sacrifice ISO or which would you tend to lessen? Okay, um, I would say... Um the ISO depends on the camera, okay, and yeah, the more expensive cameras allow you to use higher ISO levels, we know that, that's a gimme. So it kind of depends on um, what level of camera you're using. I mean, when I had the Canon 20D, you know, ISO of 800 and you were struggling. Um, I would say, obviously, if you are hitting the limit of your ISO, then you've got to be very aware of that and, um, you know, try and bring it back if you can. I would sacrifice um, a little bit of aperture first uh, and try and keep the shutter speed higher um, as much as possible because I know that that just allows you to get that more uh, slight sharper detail. Um, you know, the, the, the lowest aperture that I would shoot a, a kind of a portrait shot with from choice would be f4. That really would be the, the, 
to the kind of bottom. Ideally, F8 would be great, um, but you know we all know that certainly in the UK we don't have that amazing flood of light to use. So um, it, it's a bit of a personal call, really, and you, you know you, you you've got to try different things and experiment different things with your camera and equipment. You know, there's there's not one blanket answer, but I, I would certainly say you know. I'd perhaps move down from f8 to maybe 7 or 5.6 or whatever and try and try and keep the ISO as low as it there but also be aware that it's better to have a slightly noisier image that's as sharp as possible than one that's completely out of focus because your shutter speed was too slow. Brilliant mate. Um, oh, this was quite a good bo a point actually and I should have asked it when you were talking about it. Somebody's just asked what what uh, when you talk about the back focus button can you what what is that? So for somebody starting out who might Sorry. not be familiar with that. That's fine. Sorry. Yeah, no the back focus. Not all cameras have this, okay, but if your camera, um, when you half depress your shutter button then that automatically triggers the autofocus and you can use that to track, okay, and uh, so you'd half depress, you'd track the dog, and then when you wanted to take the shot, you just fully press it. Um, the cameras that have the AF back button, it's just a, literally a button on the back of the camera that does the same things. But what it allows you to do is keep your thumb on the AF back button. That then activates the autofocus, so you can track, track, track with that, and then it keeps the finger free, so you can do short bursts on the shutter button, uh, and you're not necessarily taking hundreds of shots as such, as such. Uh, and, it, and it just it just works a little bit better, um, I, I think because the AF button is just in one particular job rather than, than, than two, it just seems to track that little bit more accurately and it's certainly very, very popular with your kind of high-end sports photographers, they, they, they would certainly use it avidly, so I, I, I would certainly recommend it if your camera's got it, but if, if your camera hasn't got it, it's not a deal breaker, just half depress your shutter button and when you're ready to take the shot, just fully press it and job done. Brilliant, mate. Thanks for that. Um, do you have a top tip for getting rid of saliva, or do you do it in post-production? Uh, Kleenex works for that. Wipes. Uh, it's funny. Um, I did a shoot with a lady who had a Labrador been running around, and this dog had created, the, uh, for people who will know, the hugest fangs you've ever imagined. And I said to her, look, you know, do you want to wipe those out of the picture? And she said, no, 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 leave those in. That's my dog. And I'm like, really? And she said, yeah, absolutely, I want them in. So, and she did, and she wanted the portrait with these huge fangs in. Completely got me, but there you go. But again, that's understanding your client, know, and, you know, and knowing what they want. Um, what most owners, what they do is they're aware that obviously if their dog sweats or slobbers, then they, they have a cloth with them, we can wipe it. You've got to be aware of the kind of, I call them eye bogies, you know, the little bits of sleep in the eye. You can easily Photoshop that up or, or Lightroom that out, etc. Um, if the slob is too severe, try and wipe it. Otherwise, you may have a nightmare in Photoshop. You know, with any kind of animal fur, it's not as straightforward sometimes to to remove these kind of things if the fur is moving in different directions. You could be there for hours, and you know, life's too short for that guy. So try and try and do as much as you can on 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 the day when you're actually taking the photo. But or you know, sometimes you do have to resort to Photoshop to remove certain things. Brilliant. Um, okay, we are getting there, but guys, I will say now that I'm, I'm going to ask the questions that we have, please, uh, because we've run quite a bit over and we still have some stuff to share with you. So um, so these are the questions I'm going to ask. So all of the questions I have now are the ones I'll ask, and I promise you that I'll ask them. Okay. But um, we'll have to stop it at that, otherwise I think we'll be here all night. And, and I think, <laughs> yeah. well, we, we, already, well, we were, go, we were going to share with them, obviously, this is the first of uh, several webinars that we'll be doing. And as I said, we've got the video series Definitely. launching tomorrow anyway. Um, so, uh, any tips then for photographing older dogs? Do you have to treat them differently? But also in the same question, and older owners. Um, yeah, I think what what you uh, what you've got to remember with older dogs is that there may be health issues. Okay, and um, you know. Uh, the portraits then are probably going to be the more important shots for the owners. Um, so don't do the portraits and then say, well, let's go do the action shots. I've got a jump, the big agility jump. Let's get your dog jumping over that. It's just not going to work and it's just going to upset the whole thing. Um, what I find is with some of the portraits is that when clients actually see some of the images, they don't realize sometimes how old their dogs maybe are. And when they see them, you know, I'm going slightly grey, as you know, Jay, and uh, as you'll see in the films <laughs> if, if you tune in tomorrow. But um, 
you know, they might see under the kind of chin, the grain, if it's a black Labrador and that kind of thing. Um, and that can be a bit of a shock sometimes to them. So, you know, you've got to be aware of that. And, you know, don't try and hide these things, though, because, you know, that is how their dogs are at that particular time. But what I would say about older dogs is, you know, keep the session calm. You know, if the dogs are older, they're probably more subdued, a little bit quieter, they don't want all this excitement, just work with the dogs. And every dog's got its individual character. So you've, you've got to learn or have the ability to pick up these signals very, very quickly. Um, so never ever, you know, do do something for this for the sake of a photograph that's going to put a dog's potential health at risk or whatever, or push them to something where they're going to be uncomfortable. As regards owners, then yeah, obviously I've got a client um, who I booked in today, and she's uh, bringing with her her mum, and she asked whether you know the the ground where we do the photos at the old hall is level, and I said, you know, do you mind me asking why? And she said, well, because her her, her mum's had a stroke. And um, you know, it's just making sure that she can get around okay. So absolutely, you know, th these are key things. You you've got to be aware of these things. And sometimes, if you're photographing dogs and you're out in a different environment, it could be, uh, you know, on on tricky ground where it's uneven and things like that. So al always be aware of that. Definitely, yeah. Brilliant, mate. Um, we've had a couple of questions. We're not going to go into uh, uh, massive depth on these, but with regards to the sort of the business side of things, but I know this is stuff that we're going to cover as part of your film series in the next batch of filming. But um, just so a couple of quick pointers and, and a bit of advice, really. In your sales process and are the clients uh, viewing the images or are they viewing them via your site? What's, what's the best? What do you think is best for sales? Um, I, when I first started and I was doing um, trial events or if it's a dog show or, you know, where there's hundreds of dogs and, you're to, you know, it's like a dog day in effect where you've been invited to, then obviously you have to post online. And um, what I've done is um, I've recently moved to Smugbook and um, they are fantastic. I, honestly, that the Smugbook are amazing. Honestly, I, I can't praise them highly enough. They have an incredible gallery facility there, which shows the images off, uh, full screen, etc. And they've got all the buying options there. For that kind of thing, it's perfect. It's absolutely great uh, online. If I've done um, a um, one-off, what we call private commission, where they've, 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 com they've come to me, they want me to take specific photographs, then that will be uh, a private viewing, only because we can then show the images in the detail that they deserve, okay? Because we'll have spent, you know, a lot of time when we're taking the pictures, getting them right, the detail, etc. We want to show them off to the very, very best, obviously. Brilliant, mate. Um, when starting out in the dog photography, and obviously it's a specialist market, um, how do you so how do, how do you best advise that they sort of start pricing themselves? Is it looking at what's around, or do you go higher than you would expect? What what so how would you get them started on their sort of putting their price list together? Do you think? I think um, pricing. It, it, if if you're a photographer that's already doing um, portraiture or, or or weddings or whatever or some other form of photography, then obviously that would kind of fit in with what you're doing. But if if you're new and you're kind of starting out, then it's always difficult pricing, and and you know it's hard for me to kind of speak for somebody else. But what you have to do is I would look around to see what other people are charging, and sort of obviously I, I I'm in a very privileged position now. Where obviously I've, I've been going a few years now and uh, you know people know me and may come to me to, to create a certain thing so compared to when I started I, I can obviously um, I'm in a luxurious position where I can charge a little bit more but if, if you're if if somebody's coming to you for a shoot and they specifically contacted you to actually you know do a shoot of their dog whatever then you've got to value your time and you've got to think well hold on a minute they've come to me they've obviously seen my work they like my work um, you know, you know, value it accordingly. Value your time. You know, it's so important, and it makes me so angry when people just, you know, give work away, and you'll go to events and just, oh, there's the disc of all the images, etc. Yeah, um, the one time that you know, and I've given stuff away in the past, but you have to make a decision and say, is this going to help the future of my business? Is there a potential there to help my business by me doing this? Is it going to be a two-way street? If it isn't, you know, people. Clients sadly will just take, 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 and not necessarily uh, give, or um, what they promised will not necessarily come through. So you have to make that shout. But I think with pricing, it's a little bit trial and error. You know, sometimes you're going to 
you think, oh, you know, I could have got away with charging more than that or whatever. Just, just go out there, give it a go, and see, and you know, see what other people are doing in your area. I think that that that's a great place to start. Yeah, it's a tough one, and I wanted to ask it because we always get asked it, and we face that yeah, question yeah. in all of our business sessions with the portraits and the weddings. And we, we we can tell you what our prices are, but we've worked hard at getting our prices to the level that they're at. And as you said, you've worked very hard at what you've done. You've got to be realistic. You've got to go and see what's out there. Then you do have to value you yourself and you're absolutely right there and that was Definitely. perfect in the answer uh, but we can't tell you what to price and charge for it because we don't know your area we don't know your level of photography you're the best character judge for that and if nothing else put a bit more on it because you can always bring it back Definitely. and go well you know what i'll give you a discount you know that's all exactly. that, that's that sells for you perfect brilliant mate on that um do we need a specific level of insurance when working with dogs or animals that you're aware of or is it just covered under your sort of photography insurance um i would public liability insurance uh, i'm sure would be fine um i mean what i would say is you know it's dogs dogs are dogs and you know they all vary in characters and things like that um be, be fine. Absolutely, public liability insurance should 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 cover you. Always be aware, like any you know, if you're doing any type of photography, don't go leaving your bags in stupid places and people tripping over them and all that kind of thing. And obviously, just be aware of the ground that you're going on and make sure that everyone's safe and everyone's happy, including the dogs. And you know, all all should be well. But no, certainly nothing I've come across. I've I've, I've got standard public liability insurance. Brilliant. Um, I think this was from the same person, actually, so it was kind of a two-point question, uh, but this was a little bit more to do with safety. When there are, say, children involved in the shoot also, do you take any extra safety measures? And I, I was kind of going to answer it for you because you would expect the children to sort of be familiar with the dogs, uh, but I, so I don't know if they were meaning whether we were in a an open space or something like that because obviously yeah. safety is an issue, isn't it, if you're not talking about children that are related to the dogs as such so like if you're in a park or something that'd be a different different thing altogether wouldn't it yeah no completely i think i think with anyone uh, that's involved in the shoe obviously safety is paramount and you know certainly things like water uh, you're next to that you know if, if you're next to a river bank or something like that then always just 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 be aware but you know i mean the parents are going to be there as well so you know you would never take sole charge of of children like that, you'd always have someone there to be a kind of guardian anyway. So the emphasis is more on them, I would say, to kind of you know look after them. And but but you know always make sure that you are in a, a reasonably safe place. And if there are if you are going to a, to the water's edge or whatever, then then just make people aware of that. And you know uh, I, I'm sure all will be fine. Um, as regards um, parks and things, that's quite a good point actually. If, what what I'm always conscious of as well is finding out, you know, is the dog okay off lead? Um, we had one occasion where here at the old hall where you know the owner let the dog off and it just bolted. I uh, got got the smell of a rabbit and bang, it was off. And thankfully where we are, it's all fenced in and it's all safe. But if that had been in a public car, uh, um, park or whatever, then that dog could have gone. So sometimes you know you have to might use use things like long leads and things like that where you must never risk that dog's safety at or ever. So, you know, don't let that dog off the leader. If, if the owner is a bit nervous about it, you have to work around it. You've always got to work to the dog. Brilliant, mate. Uh, okay. Um, I think you touched on this earlier, but I'll ask it again quickly. Do you ever use auto ISO at all, or are you taking complete control of the camera? Um, that's an interesting one, actually. Um, I shoot Canon, as you know, and... Um, Canon has an auto ISO f f feature. I don't think it works particularly well, so I use manual uh, ISO selection. Um, it's <laughs> on the dark side, on the Nikon side, and uh, I have great bands about this. I don't care who, what type of camera you use, honestly, guys. I know the Nikon system, the auto ISO, is very, very good, and it does work better. So it's purely down to experimenting and seeing what works best for you. But me, personally, I use manual. Brilliant. Uh, well, there's a Canon question, and again, it's one of these techie ones, so I'm just going to ask it to you as it is. Um, <laughs> Canon, uh, so this is how it's written, Canon A1 Servo, first or second image priority, question mark? I, I use first image priority. There we go. Sorted. Answered. Brilliant. Um, couldn't be simpler. See, yeah, why was I afraid of that question? Right. <laughs> okay, so we, we're getting there. And a few more, and then I do want to tell them about the dog photographer of the year, because I know it's important that we talk about it. Yeah, um, 
I have two settings on my camera continuous uh, for continuous shooting one is high speed and low speed would I be should I be choosing high speed for the action shots well in general should I be choosing the high speed option every time high speed every single time use your camera at the highest frame rate that you can that's um, kind of why it's so important to use a fast memory card so that you know you can process these images as quickly as possible but you know if 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 you hold your, your your finger on the shutter button, you know for however long, you, at some point you're going to hit that buffer. So again, burst is quite good, but uh, you know to get into the habit of using. But just be aware of how quickly, depending on the camera you've got, how quickly you could potentially hit that buffer. So don't go too mad, otherwise you can miss the shot exactly when it happens. Perfect. Uh, okay, we're almost there. Oh, how many images on uh, how many average? Uh, on average, how many images do you present to a client in a viewing? Um, it, it varies. It varies on how well the session's gone, um, you know, and how many bet, uh, on what variety of shots we, we've, we've done. But it could be anything between 30 and 70. Brilliant. Brilliant, mate. Well, two things before we talk about the photographer, the Kennel Club photographer of the year, which we've definitely got to talk about because uh, that's really right. important to anybody who's with us. Um, just want to share this with you. Um, one, uh, I can't wait to see the films. Well, I've had the privilege of knowing what's in them because I shot them. So I apologise if they're out of focus, but I'm pretty sure they're not. Um, so we start tomorrow. The series with Andy starts tomorrow, and tomorrow we're kind of touching on what's in the bag and what's important for uh, for starting out with dog photography. But the series is great because it covers everything from what to use, uh, location scouting, and then we look at portraits, uh, a portrait session. We also look at the action shots in depth. And then we were also lucky to, enough to shoot a, a commercial shoot that Andy was doing for some, uh, it was dog trainer, wasn't it? It was a dog trainer. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so so we can see the, uh, so the, pli the, the private client side of things over the next few weeks in the films. And then you'll also be seeing the, the commercial side of it as well. So they're very similar, uh, but the way things are slightly different uh, at sort of the different approaches that Andy takes. So a great series of films kicking off tomorrow on the Photography Academy. Uh, I wanted to share this with you. Well, A, somebody said, can't wait to see the films. But B, I've just really, I love this when it came through and I've hung on to it for ages. Uh, I've just realized that Andy photographed myself and my dog in the main ring at Crufts and I've bought his images but didn't realize it was the same person. <laughs> so that, oh, that's so. <laughs> Well, thanks for buying it. <laughs> yeah, excellent, thanks. Um, Andy, you've mentioned obviously that a big turning point for you and obviously starting your career uh, was actually coming runner-up two years in a row for the, the Kennel Club Photographer of the Year, wasn't it? Jay, honestly, I can't tell you and uh, I, I can still remember uh, the phone call um, from the second year when I actually had two places and I was in my battle old Land Rover in Crew Alex football car park believe it or not and um, Heidi who runs the Kennel Club Pizza Library phoned me up and uh, said Andy you know you'll, you'll never believe it you've, you've, you've won another place and uh, and then said actually it's not just one you've won two uh, honestly you know between you guys I, I, when I put the phone down I, I just cried you know because I put so much work into that and it was that time to get that recognition because I, I I still get nervous presenting photos to clients now because I they mean so much to me and I want them to like them and uh, you know I, I I just want them to be happy and um, you know to to get that recognition from such a, an established you know from the biggest dog dog photography competition in the world bar none um, was just amazing and it was that point that I decided to go professional and that's the absolute truth people you know, it's a story but it's not it's absolutely true it was that millisecond that says right I'm going professional that's it so it means the world to me this competition brilliant so the competition and is open now isn't it so everybody needs to it's open yeah absolutely and there's and, and uh, I think you're, you're going to show the the website link can't you Jay if you're not already if, uh, if, but, um, if I haven't shared it the best place I will share it but I'm going to share it on the Facebook page so um, right. I, I'll share that um, with them tomorrow so if you uh, go to the Photography Academy Facebook page tomorrow um, I will share with you the uh, the link to, to the the Kennel Club but if you go to the Kennel Club website you simply just search on that it's Kennel yeah. Club Photographer of the Year 
um, you'll find it. Um, Andy, you're actually one of the sponsors this year, so you're giving away numerous places on your workshops. So uh, so that's that's great. Yeah. And also, of course, our friends at Smug Mug are involved now as well, and uh, they're giving away numerous accounts in the different categories. So uh, along with many other prizes, and of course, uh, the accolade then is the, if you win it of the photographer of the year. So, um, so uh, uh, the main Definitely. reason, obviously, to to take part. But yeah, I'll share those links uh, tomorrow on the Photographer Academy Facebook page. But if not, if you just uh, go to the Kennel Club, and you'll find uh, the the Photographer of the Year uh, link on their site. Um, Andy, obviously, we've talked about uh, Smug Mug and how you use it. They are friends of ours, as they're friends of yours. So if anybody is interested in using Smug Mug, we do get a twenty percent discount on a pro account. Um, and the way to do that is you go to the Photography Academy website, you click the Smug Mug logo, which is on the top in the sponsors links, and you'll see a try it for now button. And we have our discount embedded into that try it for now, but try it free button. And if you click that, do the trial at the checkout stage, then if you do buy the account, you'll have a 20% discount. Andy, thank you so much for your time tonight. Uh, we well and truly ran over, but everybody stayed with us. I'm sorry about that. I know no, it's Andy, there's nothing to apologize for because we had loads to get through. And, they were, and obviously, we know you're coming back. We said we got the films starting tomorrow and uh, we'll definitely be scheduling we'll probably do some more sort of in a closer look webinars we'll probably look at the action shot in more depth and okay. we'll look at the portrait in more depth um, so as we go we'll sort of plan and maybe a series of them over the next couple of months to, uh, to to back up the film content that's on the site there before we go Andy we should remember we haven't done we haven't touched on it of course you run your own one-to-one uh, -one and your own workshops as well um, so if anybody wants, yeah you want to get yourself along to the old lodge and spend a couple of days with Andy go to andybigger.com that's right isn't it I've got that right uh, yeah, andybigger.com, all the details on there, absolutely, it's two amazing days, we get all the gun dogs down, and uh, we have, you know, we spend a lot of time out in the field, it's not all in the classroom, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll literally go through, right from the start, for all levels of photographers, from, you know, someone who's literally picked up a camera, right through to very, very hard and professionals, and uh, we just have a great bus for two days, guys, honestly, it's great fun. And I can vouch for the uh, the hotel that everybody stays at because the yeah. food because the, the food was awesome and it's a great. Food's good, yeah. Yeah, so that, to yeah, do it, do it. great great location. <laughs> I've had the privilege of meeting some of the dogs. You'd, you'd have a great two days with Andy there with the team. That'd be brilliant. Uh, Andy, thanks for joining us, mate. Um, we're well. I, think you, you, I know you. Uh, uh, we'll uh, plan on the next shooting. Uh, real soon but uh, like I said the series kicks off tomorrow anyway um, so that'll be on the site from probably tomorrow lunchtime Andy good night mate all the best take care everyone good night take care everyone thank you bye bye